welcome to everyone. It's really nice to have got to this second session, which is the third step in our um, project that we had. We called it a project because it gives it uh, ideas of grandeur, that it's um, to support the publication of the practical guide. And this was all to do with a, um, a key task that we had, which was to help dossier submitters um, to put dossiers in and to prepare dossiers that are fit for purpose. So the three steps we had was to organize the information session, which we did to launch the practical guide. And we had the survey and that was on the 26th of May. And I guess many of you will have attended that. And thank you also for the positive comments we had afterwards. We launched the survey, which we explained at that session. And this was to collect information uh, from you about different things and we will present that. That was completed in September, and thank you to everyone who did provide information. It's very useful for us, and Kiara will make a presentation of those results. And so the third step was to organize this session today, which we're on, and that's what we're doing today, is to come to the end part of this project um, and to follow up what we said we would do. So the program for today is here. The moderator is Paul Ryan. He's the new head of unit for Hazard one, which is classification and OELs. And we will have an introduction as well from Mike Rassenberg, who's the new director for Directorate C Hazard. We'll then have a presentation from a member state, and we will welcome Louise Conway from Ireland. Um, we were going to have two presentations, but unfortunately, uh, Germany, the presenter was not able, was not at work recently and hasn't been able to do it, which is a shame. So, um, but it was too late to be able to organize something else. But we very much welcome Louise to come and give us her experience. We will then have the survey results from Chiara. Uh, then we will have a short break. And following that, we will, we've got two sessions addressing a number of things that came from the last session, which was looking at the CLH dossiers that come in as a result of an active substance in PPP, in the pesticides, and for the active substances under biocides. So we will have people from EFSA uh, giving the first presentation and then uh, Gazina from here in ECHA for the biocides. After that, we've taken up a topical um, subject, which is read across. There will also be something about it, and that's mostly how to support a grouping entry for CLH or how you go about this. There was a number of questions, so we thought it was good to give a, a general presentation on this. And then at the end, the closing and conclusions will be made by Paul. So with that, I will hand over to uh, Paul as the moderator to take the next steps. Thank you very much and good afternoon from my side too. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, it's my great pleasure, as Stella said, to host you today. So I'll be taking you through the session right to the end. Um, but maybe first of all, before I start, maybe I give the floor to Mike Rosenberg, who's the new director for Hazard, as Stella said, to take you through the dossier submission work and put it in the landscape, in the greater landscape of our Hazard work. Mike. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon uh, <clears throat> from Helsinki. Um, you see many changes. New head of unit for classification and, uh, and labeling classification and OEL unit with Paul Ryan. Me, as the new uh, director for Hazard, in the previous webinar, you could still see uh, Crystal Musset, um, who, has, who is um, retired um, by now. Um, the actual fact that we have a webinar was also a change, because the original plan was to have a meeting face-to-face, -face, uh, which unfortunately couldn't happen. So that, with the creativity of the team, it went into uh, broken down in the steps as Stella just uh, just explained. Um, and we're living in a world of more and more changes with the region CLP review ongoing, the chemical strategy um, going on as we speak, where the commission, uh, uh, together with stakeholders, is uh, is looking at how to further improve the chemicals regulations. And in all these changes and all these new phases, there is the constant of the classification and labeling, at least uh, as long as I've been part of chemicals management, which is not since the very beginning, but at least since 1998. 
And the, the fir my first exposure indeed was classification and labeling in general, and more specifically the importance in back then the Annex 1, now Annex 6, the harmonized classification. And the, the real fundamental backbone uh, function it has in chemicals management, generally truly implemented in the supply chain, uh, as far as my knowledge and experience goes. So it's incredibly important piece in the chemicals management um, setup, um, not only in Europe, but it has implications all over the world. Um, and in today's webinar, we pick up from where we left off in the sense of we did a first round looking at the practical guide, then we did the survey. So we, we talk about the update of the practical guide and we, we broaden the scope and the people um, participating more actively in presentations with Ireland, EFSA and, and the Biocides colleagues. And all of this in the context of um, better dossier submission will lead to a smoother process and ultimately to better quality opinions and a better quality uh, CLH. So with all the changes and all um, new people changes, uh, there is an increased expectation on the CLH playing a fundamental backbone role in all of this. And I think in that context, it is good that um, it is recognized that we have a very powerful, well-working already uh, tool. But like in a session today, to, to further improve it and to enrich it uh, and to have a more integrated um, look at it with different regulations like the PPP and the biocides is, is, the, is the next step forward in, uh, in using this classical tool, this uh, evergreen tool in an ever-evolving world. And with that, I want to hand back to uh, Paul and wish you a very successful uh, webinar. Thank you, Mike. So moving on, I can just echo what Mike said. I mean, if you go back one slide, sorry, uh, for a second. Um, maybe, and I said I mentioned this already, but just to frame things a bit for you. So we've already published the practical guide, which you know or you can find on the website. Um, so that's the aim of today, to build on that. There was a previous webinar. I think you can go to the website if you haven't seen that or attended that, and you can watch that one there if you've missed the first session. But today's session is really to build on that. Uh, and as Mike said, it's the foundation. I mean, the dossier submission step is the first step, and it really is the foundation of a good opinion moving through the whole process and through RAC. So all the work we do at the start here in, in dossier submission step and all the collaboration we have with you really helps to build better dossiers. Uh, you've heard from Stella what we're going to cover already today. So we're going to look at the survey. Uh, we're going to see from, from Ireland a little bit of a member state experience, and then we'll pick up a bit on the plant protection products and biocides and how they integrate with our... CLH process, and finally read across. So without further ado, I'll pass to the first speaker today, which is Louise Conway from the Irish Health and Safety Authority. I hope you're ready, Louise. I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Please, Thank you. Please go ahead. Thanks, Paul. And thanks um, to Eka also from our side for the invitation to present to you today. So as my side says, I'm going to take you through very briefly some, some experience that we've had with, with submitting our um, proposals under, under this process. So next slide, please. So just a brief overview of what I'll cover. Um, I'll give you uh, just an update on who we are um, and our experience, as I said already, with, with the CLH process. And I wanted then to touch on maybe three areas where we had some maybe specific feedback or, or comments. And these are on the report, the CLH report template itself, um, the accordance check process, um, and our interactions with ECHA during this process. And then I'll present some overall conclusions. So next slide, please. So just briefly to, to give you a context to my presentation, um, the Health and Safety Authority is the lead Irish competent authority for REACH and CLP. And so in this context, we will prepare um, uh, CLH proposals for REACH registered substances in particular. Um, and just to give, a, I suppose, a, an overview, we, our focus is usually on, on human health hazard classes, although actually we have an environmental proposal in the pipeline at the moment. Um, and in terms of our resources in this area, um, we aim to prepare one new proposal per year. So that's that's where we, we usually aim at about one, one or so proposals per year. So next slide, please. 
Um, I just wanted to clarify just, I mean, I know we will also be talking about plant protection products and biocides within this webinar. So I wanted to maybe put into context where my presentation fits. Um, we don't have any responsibility for plant protection products and biocides. Uh, these actually fall under the remit of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in Ireland. Um, and so my presentation today will really focus on our experience with, with REACH substances. Next slide, please. So, what is our experience so far? Well, I think overall we would say it's actually quite good, which is, is positive, I guess, for, for the beginning of this webinar. Um, I think in particular, I wanted to, to pull out some things which we think are, are really good and really useful for us. Um, there's obviously a lot of guidance on ECHA's website, and I think overall we find this very useful, and we would consult this um, during the preparation of our CLH proposals. So, we think this is quite useful. Um, the CLH report template itself, we find that also very useful. It, it provides a really nice structure for presenting the data. Um, and so this is it's obviously also a positive. Um, I think from our side, one of the things that we really wanted to highlight today is that the support that we get from the ECHO colleagues. Um, I think we found that the ECHO colleagues are really very willing to provide advice, both, on, I suppose, more generally on the CLH process, um, but also case specific technical advice. And I think from the dossier submitters perspective, this is very much appreciated. So, so thank you to ECHA for that. Um, we have identified some areas where we think there is perhaps room for improvement, or we could consider whether they are working maybe as well as, as we would like them to, or hope they, they should. And I'll, I'll cover these in the next few slides. So next slide, please. So the first area that I wanted to touch upon is the, the CLH report template itself. Um, and for those of you who are used to preparing these, will, you will know that there's uh, two sections in the report template which cover um, history of the previous classification and labeling activities, and then a section on justification that action is needed at community level. And this is in accordance with Article 36.3 of CLP. Um, but what we note, I suppose, is that there is currently no section in the template for other regulatory activities or history other than classification and labelling. And what we wanted to point out, I suppose, is that this information is maybe particularly important for REACH substances, um, because a proposal for harmonised classification and labelling uh, might be an identified follow-up action, actually, from other REACH processes. So, for example, as an outcome of substance evaluation. And actually, in fact, um, the, the requirement to have this information in a CLH proposal was picked up in an accordance check by ECA for one of our proposals. So it obviously is information that needs to be there. Um, for that reason, I, we were suggesting maybe that the template could be updated to indicate where this information should be included. And actually also what, what type of information should be included, um, because we think this would help to ensure that information is uh, reported in a consistent manner uh, across CLH proposals. So, next slide, please. Uh, the second point that I wanted to touch upon with respect to the, the CLH report template is, is the role of Annex 1 to the CLH report. And again, I'm sure most of you are aware that it, it's possible to prepare an annex to, to the CLH report, and this is kind of known, I suppose, as Annex 1. And the idea of this is, is that you are able to prepare detailed um, study summaries uh, for, for studies that are referred to in the CLH report itself. Um, and we're aware that it's not a requirement to prepare this annex, that it's done voluntarily. Um, we noted actually after the last CLH webinar that we had in, in May of this year, when in the Q&A document that was published, uh, the following statement was stated that, that the Annex 1 was developed to facilitate using extracts of, of the DARS and CARS and similar. Um, and if sufficient information is available the report, in the CLH report itself, the Annex is not needed. So I suppose from this, we understand that the Annex 1 was kind of developed with, with plant protection product and biocides in mind, I suppose. and so. We are a little bit unsure about the role of, of this for REACH substances. I think from our own experience, the preparation of an Annex 1 is very time consuming. Um, and we're also not always clear if it's taken into account during the process. So, for example, does ECHA look at the, the Annex 1 during the accordance check? Um, does RAC consult it during their opinion forming? Um, indeed, we've had this, this scenario where we have had points uh, required in, a, in an accordance checkout from, from ECHA, uh, which were already included in the Annex 1, for example. So, we think that further guidance uh, would be useful on when the preparation of an Annex 1 adds value 
to the process. So we were thinking maybe if you had a proposal where there were perhaps a lot of um, non guideline studies, for example, that this could be a useful uh, time to prepare an annex 1. Equally, we were wondering, is it better to. For, to prepare a longer CLH report and not have any annex. So it, it's just, I think, an area that maybe some further uh, guidance from ECHA could be quite useful. Next slide, please. The next uh, point that I wanted to cover is around the accordance check. Um, and I suppose our experience is that when we prepare a CLH report and before we submit it for accordance check, we do a number of internal checks of the report. So we check it ourselves for consistency and accuracy and it has undergoes a number of peer review steps internally. One of the other things that we do is that we can compare our proposal um, to other recent and I say accepted CLH proposals. So those that have uh, past accordance check and are now published on ECHA's website, um, which have similar hazard classes to our own. And the reason that we do this is in order to sort of ensure that we are being consistent with, with other accepted proposals, that we've included similar levels of details, addressed similar points, um, and to make sure that we're submitting, I suppose, the best CLH proposal that we can. Um, but what we have found on a number of occasions is that uh, our proposal maybe doesn't pass the accordance check for issues that were also present in other CLH proposals. Um, now, while I understand that each each case is is assessed on a case by case basis, um, equally this makes it quite difficult to predict the outcome of an accordance check from from the dossier submitter's perspective. Um, but also, it also makes it quite difficult for us to learn from the process in order to improve our future proposals. So, next slide, please. Um, also, on the accordance check process, we um, we have, I suppose, a question around the required versus the recommended revisions, which ECHA um, note in the accordance check outcome. So, we completely accept, I suppose, that the required revisions are necessary for the CLH report to be accepted, and, and these are without question, I suppose. Um, but where we want to focus maybe is on the role of these recommended revisions and and. and Really, some we find quite useful, I suppose, and they have um, helped us to clarify certain points in the proposal. But others we have found, and, and our maybe our perception is that they are maybe less about correcting an inaccuracy or, or an omission in the CLH proposal, and more maybe about the preferred wording or editor, editorial style of, of whoever at ECA is reviewing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I suppose where we are coming from with this is that. It, Obviously, implementing these revisions takes time and resources. I would say both on the side of ECHA because it, it requires them to review them and to document them in the accordance check outcome, and then obviously to check the resubmitted CLH proposal, um, but also obviously on our side to make those changes. And I suppose what we're asking maybe is that we, we check to make sure that everything that we're doing here is adding value to the process so that we're not uh, making changes that are really not adding any value. So next slide, please. So I suppose considering all of these things together, um, we had maybe a few suggestions or thoughts around the accordance check process that, that maybe we could consider further. Um, we think there might we should look for ways maybe to improve the predictability of the accordance check process. And I say this like it's an easy thing to do, and I, I appreciate that it's it's not that straightforward. Um, but that said, we we could maybe perhaps look at maybe improving the template, the CLH report template, so that it's a little bit more prescriptive about what information is needed, so that we are at least trying to address all of the points at the very beginning of the process and not waiting on the accordance check to do this. Um, we think it, it there's merit maybe in, in ensuring that there's consistency between CLH proposals with similar hazard classes, so the, the outcome of those, um, the accordance check outcomes for, for CLH proposals with similar hazard classes. And again, I understand and, I, and we completely appreciate that these are all case by case assessments, but equally there should be some, some level of consistency between them. Um, we think as well that there's maybe a need to look at the recommended revisions in the accordance check to see, well, are they really needed and are they adding value to the process? Um, we also wondered maybe is it is it possible to pull some of these out into into some guidance or a tip sheet that so that they're not repeated in every single proposal and maybe this is another way of of giving the same feedback to the dossier submitters. 
Um, and finally, I mean, coming back to the role of Annex 1, we do think maybe that clarifying the role of, of this document might also help in, in, this, in this area. So, next slide, please. The final point I wanted to touch on is around uh, their interactions with ECHA during the process. And as I've said already, we, we have found and our experience has been that the ECHA colleagues are really very willing to, to provide advice and support. Um, and so there's really quite good interaction between ECHA and the dossier submitter. We have found prior to the submission of the proposal um, during the accordance, steps, accordance, sta accordance check stage, excuse me, and also during the response to comments stage following the consultation. Um, what we have found, though, that there is sometimes quite limited interaction between ECHA and the dossier submitter after the response to comments is submitted. Um, and again, I suppose here we understand that the dossier submitter maybe no longer has an active role in the process, um, but still that dossier submitter still has an interest in following the case uh, and seeing the outcome of the process. And I, I think even maybe more so for the member states or dossier submitters, that they may be waiting or relying on the outcome of the CLH process to start or work on further uh, risk management activities. So there is a vested interest in, in seeing the outcome of the case there. So we think it might be useful to provide um, some updates um, on where the pro proposal is in the process as early as possible. Um, so even information like which RAC meeting it's scheduled for, if this could be known as early as possible, it would allow us to, to do some internal planning and, and schedule for it. So next slide, please. So just briefly, I suppose a few very high level conclusions. As I said a number a number of times, I think our experience is generally that it's good. We have good experience, we have good interactions with ECHA, um, and I think the support that ECHA provide is really, really very good and helpful. Um, we do think that there are some areas where further improvements might be needed, and I think in particular to improve the consistency and predictability of the process, because ultimately this will reduce time and resources needed on both sides. Um, and I think, you know, as has already been alluded to, there, there are a number of very ambitious um, goals within the chemical strategy with respect to CLP. So I think we need to work um, together to ensure that the CLH process is as robust as possible. So I think that might be my next, my last slide. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. Some some great tips there, and some I think valid questions for for us. Um, I'm looking at Chiara. Do you want to? Do we? Have, there's no questions. Do you want to answer to some of the questions that Louise put already? Or yeah. Um, hi, um, Stella here. I can take a, just a couple of points that you made there, Louise, and things that we work on as well. And that was about uh, consistency and uh, repetition of giving advice. And you're exactly right in, in what you say. And it is extremely difficult to, to do this. And really, unbelievably, every dossier is a case-by-case -case basis. They really don't come in looking at all similar in any way. So that's our sort of starting point. However, you know, there are um, the advice is given, and I'll take the example of uh, redacting names and for, for, for a data protection. And there is advice to do that, but you would be surprised how many times we have to write in a dossier to tell people to redact the names. So for us, there is also frustration about repeating the advice we have to put all the recommendations, um, or in that case, it would be a requirement because it obviously has to be fulfilled. And for consistency, we are making a lot more um, efforts into checking them. We have a, a system where it is checked and co-checked. And uh, until recently, I looked at every uh, dossier that went out, the comments that went for accordance check, to see how they're written and what they're saying. And in the last three years, I've seen an improvement in that. But it's extremely challenging to try and find everything to be so consistent. And we, we haven't moved to standard text, just copying and pasting things. We very much leave it to the person who is reading the dossier, who sees how best to word it to explain the actual situation. So um, just a little bit to show how much we're working on that from our side, but absolutely totally agree with you that it, it is something, but we haven't found a magic way of, of addressing that to be really consistent on everything. And we have included in the um, practical guide, if I recall rightly, there's, a, there's a, um, a list now of things that we would look at, which are not quite tips, but they're the areas we look at to try and help that. 
Um, I can't particularly answer, clarify about Annex 1. I don't know if one of my colleagues can do that. Um, Chiara will try and explain a little bit more about that. But just to pick up those points, thank you, Louise. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yes, Annex 1. Uh, they, we usually look at Annex 1 during the quarterly checks, uh, sometimes a bit more in detail, sometimes less. It depends also on the person because, yeah, I mean, consistency is uh, true, but we are a team and we not all have the same expertise exactly. And so maybe I wouldn't notice something and my, my colleague would notice and vice versa. So, yeah, I mean, we are human. And then, um, so Annex 1, technically, yes. I mean, it's part of a CLH dossier. So if something is included in the Annex 1, it doesn't need to be repeated in the CLH report. That being said, it's also true that it's uh, much faster to look at uh, all the data, um, to have, I mean, a robust uh, study summary in one document. And then if you, there is something that you need additional information, just to go on the Annex 1 to look at it. And I think that's uh, how RAC usually use it. So it's kind of a background document if I'm not clear on some points. So that's uh, my impression, again, of how it is used. Um, oh, St Stella again, sorry, one more um, thing to come to you. you. You said about required versus recommended. And we did introduce that so that we could offer the opportunities. What we were really, the required, we, we could do an accordance check and just do the required in there which are the things that we can say have to be done in order to uh, be in, in accordance with the legislation and how it's written. And they need to be done rightly, as you've put. However, for the recommended, yes, they do vary quite a bit. And some, I guess, might be quite useful. Sometimes we see simple things like, like editorials, uh, such as even spellings. Now, spellings, you might think, why do you bother? And they're not important. But on some words, spellings might be quite important because it might completely change the meaning of the sentence. So we do pick those up to show that they're there. And the recommendations are often more about how you could clarify how something's written so that it gets, it will be more easily understood by somebody. And remember also that the, the document also goes out on, on, on a public consultation. So there are many people reading this. And it is written as recommended, so it is your choice whether to do that. What I would say is, if you're ever unsure of what that should be, is to, to contact uh, the SDM. And you're always given the contact details and come back and say, can we, can we leave these or whatever? And you can leave any of the recommendations if you choose. So just to clarify those roles for, for people that are listening. But um, your points you've made, I totally agree with you. Thanks. Thanks, Stella. So I hope we answered some of those, uh, Louise. But like Stella said, maybe uh, good good advice just to contact contact us and we continue to work together as best we can. Um, there's no questions on the Slido. Then we can maybe move to the next topic. And I think it's Kiara who's going to take us through the survey results. So please, Kiara. So hi again, everyone. And we conducted this uh, um, survey that from after this uh, first webinar until September, more or less. And, um, uh, yeah, so the survey was composed by 43 questions, and there were some questions about generalities, like kind of to know who you are and um, what role, what is your role in the CLH. Then some question on the practical guide, because that was part of uh, um, this package, and about the uh, information that there is in the practical guide about the physical hazards, human health, and the environment. So in this presentation, I intend to go through some of these um, the questions and the answer that we received. And um, yes, all the questions, uh, all the reply uh, will be aggregated. The aggregated result will be published when we update the uh, practical guides uh, next year. So about the general question, uh, one of the question is about, uh, for example, how many dossiers you uh, submit per year or how many dossiers you plan to submit on this year. And we have this nice Gaussian that you see here uh, and uh, in this graph. 
And then another question was like, have you aware, I mean, because we discussed about this during the uh, webinar on the 26th of May. So are you aware of the importance of uh, the register of intention? So to submit your intention via that. And the majority of you were aware, that, which is a nice result. And uh, some of you were not, but they plan to use it in the future, which is kind of really good also results from our side. And then on the practical guide. So the first and most important question is, uh, how do you find the practical guide? And uh, the majority said that, like, uh, yeah, overall it was understandable and easy to apply. And some were like that it was uh, somewhat understandable and, um, and uh, to applicable. And when we ask for more information, why that? So you had uh, a blank field where you could give inform information. And some uh, the below, you see some of the text that we received as in the free text. And it's, uh, yeah, information on the PPC uh, pesticide plant for a path protection product and the CLH template, how they interact templates and uh, or um, that some topic are covered and other are not. I mean, it's a practical guide. We, um, some of the topics, of course, need to be addressed in other ECA guidances. So we can't publish a guide with everything. It would be unreadable. And um, so again, about our practical guides, is any important topic missing? And then 50% uh, say like, yes, yeah, okay, cover almost everything and say like, no, you miss everything. So, okay. And so again, about the plant protection product uh, and biocider and grouping it across. And we are happy to say that about those, we will have a presentation later on uh, during this webinar. Then we had other suggestions, like for example, reliability and evaluation of the studies, substance identity. Here again, I go back and stress about, uh, please submit an intention with the registered intentions so your substance identity will be checked by our specialist in the house, even before you submit your dossier. Intellectual property regulation and about clarification about the section 2.7 of the guidance itself. And I would say that with the general rule will be we will, um, we are taking into account all those uh, um, hints that we received or your suggestion that we received, and we are go going to take them into account when, uh, when we are uh, updating the guidance. So uh, if possible, this will be included in the next update uh, that you will see next year. So another, then we go to the topic of confidential, that confidentiality that was also discussed in May. And is, um, I mean, a, a CLP uh, confidentiality is based on the article, which article 119, so what you can or what you cannot claim as confidential for a, a study, in a study. And yes, I mean, the majority of you replied that yes, the principles are clear, so everything seems, majority seems to be fine. And yeah, again, a bit of free text uh, that's, uh, distinction about copyright is not included in Article 119 of REACH. Yes, true. Again, about confidentialities, the famous author's name. We also received a question before this webinar about confidentiality of author's study names. And generally speaking, I mean, author's name of unpublished study are confidential. Um, we no longer make the distinction between vertebrate or invertebrate. So even if you have a physical other studies that have never been published, then the author name is considered confidential. And there it has to be, uh, it has not to be included in the CLH dossier that will go under consultation. So just uh, make it clear. <laughs> and again, there was a section on uh, read across and group entry. And like uh, you used uh, read across in your previous when you submitted a dossier. And then the majority of you, okay, well, 50% uh, said yes or not yet, but they are prepared. So here you have the results. And if you use the read across, did you use uh, rough or not? And there you have again the results on uh, how many among the ones that used the read across replied and uh, they used or not the, uh, the rough. Always on the same topic is, uh, are you aware of there are group entries in Annex 6? So yes, uh, you are aware. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to understand which substance are part of this group. I can um, understand that because sometimes we have groups like all the sorts of 
whatever substance, unless those um, listed elsewhere in this uh, in this uh, annex, and it can be challenging to know exactly which is included or which not. It's all unless pretty sometimes vague can be considered. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and what, are the, what are the challenges in applying the read across and the group entries? So that's we like experiences missing. That's the feedback we had from you. Uh, substance identity problems. Um, and like, okay, and which substance should be included in the group? The, how is, which is the role and how to uh, do without toxicokinetic information? Uh, the need, for example, and it generally lack of, of experience means you would like to have more training. And um, we will we'll see again what we can, uh, we can do about that. Probably none of this can be included in the revised uh, practical guide, but we will see if we can maybe include some links to existing documents or prepare something new that uh, depends on resources as well. Again, read across and group entry, which are again, same, what are your uh, challenges? And here is some of the um, text that you sent us. So like the use of bioevolution data, substance that are partly transformed, uh, difference in physical chemical properties, um, what the level of details, and the idea that there would be a template. A uh, template is quite challenging to develop because there are many cases. If you have a look at the rough, you have an idea that there are several cases for uh, with the cross already. But I hope that after this uh, uh, afternoon presentation from my colleague Yoke and some of this will be a bit more clear. So we move to the next uh, part. This was the physical hazard that was included, uh, the physical hazard section included in the practical guide. So we have only five people that apply to this part. And this, uh, uh, the physical hazard uh, is, section is clear. All of you replied yes, we're really happy about that. And like, do you usually um, use the screening procedure if they are available for the uh, physical hazard? And yeah, 50-50, I'd say. Um, on human health. We had 12 people replying to this part. So do you have any comments? Uh, and it, like not, so everything is clear. And we had some uh, comments and some free text, like uh, the use and the presentation of toxicokinetic data, especially for more mutagenicity, and how to present data for poor AM. Again, this we will uh, think of how we can integrate and what we can integrate in the revised uh, practical guide to take care of those. And there were some, uh, we we're a bit stressing about this uh, interlinked between different, uh, oh, sorry, I'm one slide further. Uh, so, so there is uh, this, a lot of um, um, entry in Annex 6 are from the DSD, so they have been translated. And for that, there was example, the acute minimum to classification, the acute toxicity is not exactly the same, um, the same criteria as the DSD. So there was the introduction of this minimum classification. And it's like, uh, this should be um, routinely, when you open the same substance, it would be nice for uh, resources to also reassess the toxicokinetic, the, the acute toxicity data. And it's like, do you do that or not? And it was like 50% um, did, so they say it depends. And the same, it was like, uh, if you assess the IDA major irritation when there is a classification proposal for uh, skin corrosion, as you see, as you know, that uh, when a substance is classified for skin corrosion in Europe is um, almost automatically, uh, automatically um, classified as a high damage. The problem comes when you have uh, data that show that the substance uh, is not skin corrosive anymore, maybe because it was an uh, old classification, and then uh, the eye damage automatically kind of drop off, unless there was a real um, assessment of the data behind it. And that's why it's important also to assess it if you have it. And there again was some question about the interlinkage between other classes. Uh, for example, STOT-AC is largely based on the acute talk studies, and the majority of you say yes, then they use, they, you are aware of those interlinked, and they, uh, and also you try to assess those other classes uh, um, to improve efficiency. So, yeah. 
Again, another really kind of obvious interlinked class is the cell, uh, germ cell mutagenicity and carcinogenicity. And yes, usually, I mean, the majority of you uh, include the um, uh, germ mutagenicity when they assess carcinogenicity. So yeah, that uh, was a good result. And historical control data, I gave a presentation also in May, so of course there was some question on the, web, on the survey. So do you include uh, the historical control data in the evaluation of carcinogenicity? Uh, majority say yes, when it's available. And do you include the reliability and the relevance assessment as is stated in the CLP guidance? And again, you had 50% yes, and the other sometimes. Still fair enough. Um, as we stressed last time, it's not enough to say like, oh, we have historical control data for the same breeds and the range is between one and five. Um, that's it. That information is not sufficient. So that's why we're like, we would like to have as much um, information as possible. And because, as you know, the historical control data changes vary on several factors, some of which are listed here and were listed in the question. And the majority, seven out of the 12, said yes, always, if I have those data, I will include them. That's nice. So, like, uh, do what we're missing in this human health uh, part. What uh, would you like to see us to, um, to give more um, help? And so those were a bit of the uh, reply that we received about uh, STOTE-C and STOTE-RE, oh, and dermal or respiratory sensitization, reproductive to CTC, and mode of action. Again, some of these questions are probably, will be updated, will be uh, looked at or kept to when we are going to update the uh, guidance on the application of CRP criteria, because it's probably not, uh, not the right uh, topic or right place, the practical guide for those uh, questions. And last, there was a few questions about the environment. And here again, we had 10 people reply to this part. And you have any comments on the practical guides? Um, majority said no, seven out of 10. And uh, some yes, one person yes, and we received this uh, um, request for clarification uh, section about the bioaccumulation. And again, what are the most commonly issued that problem that you encounter when preparing this uh, proposal for uh, environmental hazard classes? And uh, we go back to uh, lack of studies, so the details, uh, uh, what data are needed, lack of reliable information and level of detail required in the CDH report. And we had this word degradability which could be interpreted like uh, we don't know how to assess the, the, the degradability. Do we need to use degradability? It's just one word. Sometimes it's difficult to know what uh, you mean. But we will look at that and see what we can again. I mean, all this uh, free text will help us to understand what, how we can improve also the practical guide or generally speaking our other guidance to provide additional support. And um, so, the last was like, uh, uh, has the practical guy addressed those considerations? That's your, your problem. And the, I mean, like 50 said yes. And uh, um, again, it was like this free text for us to improve. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Chiara. Very comprehensive overview of the survey. Um, so you have the survey results are now in the presentation form. They'll be in this webinar, obviously. Uh, you can access them there, but they're also going to be published, as Chiara said, in the updated practical guide. Um, and it's very interesting to hear uh, from you, I mean, that you're positive on the guide and also that um, you've added some extra things that we can maybe focus on for the future. With that, I'll pass this over to, uh, to Parma, to Tunde, Dimitra, and Sylvia, who are going to talk about uh, the PPP side of things. I hope you're ready to go. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much. So my name is Tunde Molnar. Welcome all of you and good afternoon also from my side. So I'm Tunde and uh, I'm working at the EFSA Pesticide Peer Review Unit and uh, uh, I'm dealing with the coordination of the Pesticide Peer Review Unit and uh, with support from my colleagues, Dimitra Kardassi, 
also working at the, at the pesticide review unit and also from Silvia Mazzega from the application desk unit. Uh, I would like to give you a, a brief update on the alignment of the EFSA pesticide speed review process uh, with the ECA CLH process and in particular highlighting the use of the combined R CLH report uh, template in the submission of, uh, of the report to both EFSA and ECA. And just uh, I, I would like to convey the apologies from my colleague Silvia Mazzega from the application desk unit who is not able to be present today in this webinar. Next slide, please. So, just to give you an outline, what uh, we aim with this uh, presentation today from EFSA side. First, we would like to clarify the legal basis and, in particular, to go a bit of detail with the uh, revised implementing act uh, applicable for renewals with special regard to the implications for classification and labeling. And subsequently, uh, I would like to give you just a brief overview of the main principles of the combined DARR CLH report template uh, in the context of the ECHA-EFSA collaboration and the alignment of both proce procedures in the EFSA pesticides peer review as well as the classification process. And finally, uh, a brief summary of the available guidance is templates available with a few useful links uh, to IUCLID without going into detail in, in, in IUCLID. So that's the main purpose of the today's presentations from our side. Next slide, please. So indeed to start with the legal basis, uh, Already in the CRP regulation, it is clarified that the active substances uh, used in pesticides should be subject to harmonized classification and labeling. So there is a clear link uh, between the integration of the uh, CRP and the pesticides in this area. Also, uh, uh, most importantly, because some of the hazard-based approval criteria in the pesticides fields are linked to the uh, classification in accordance with uh, with the CRP criteria, in particular for uh, carcinogenicity, uh, germ cell mutagenicity, and reproduction toxicity. So we are in a way bound by the legislation to work together to align our processes already uh, uh, at that stage. And the key piece of legislation that I would like to highlight here is the revised implementing uh, act on renewals. This is the regulation 2020 slash 1740 uh, applicable for the renewal of uh, approval of uh, pesticide active substances. This has been published in November last year, repealing the previous renewal act including also the regulation, the specific regulation 2020-103 regarding the harmonized classification of active substances as of 27 of March 2021. So basically the aim of this new implementing act on renewal was to introduce the changes and the new requirements arising from the transparency regulation amending the general food, food law pertinent to renewals, mainly to uh, include the new steps regarding notification of intended studies, public consultation on the intended studies, pre-submission advice, disclosure of uh, and public consultation on the valid dossier and so on. But at the same time, I also highlight here uh, implications for the classification and renewal uh, and uh, uh, CLH process that with this new uh, implementing act, uh, the, content, the content of the regulation 2020 103 uh, uh, with regard to the detailed rules of procedures and the submission of CLH proposals in the context of the renewal of uh, pesticide active substances has been fully integrated in, into this new piece of uh, legislation. So this is the regulation that basically makes, uh, makes uh, a mandatory uh, submission of the CLH uh, 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 dossier applicable for renewal of substances for pesticide active substances and this is not directly transferred into this new implementing act and renewal so it has a main a really uh, main applications and implications uh, for the work in front of us 
And this regulation is applicable for renewals for which the approval will expire on or after the 27th of March 2024 onwards. Obviously, there are also some transitional measures applicable. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, there are some new procedural elements uh, uh, integrated into this renewal act, which is also impacting the classification and labeling process. And this is, for example, that uh, uh, now the submission of the application for the renewal of pesticide active substances should be done together with the renewal dossier. So this is a one step process in contrast to what was done in the previous uh, uh, renewal regulation. So both the re application and the renewal dossier should be submitted at least three years before the expiry of the approval period. So this is now clearly laid down in the legislation. And as well as uh, the format of the submission is now clearly explicitly stated in the regulation, this should be in, in an electronic uh, format using the IOP software package as a new dossier submission format. Uh, it has also an implication, obviously, for for uh, for the CLH process. And as I mentioned already, this new regulation is taking over all the elements coming from the regulation 2020-103, which was really related to the mandatory submission of the CLH uh, uh, proposal in the context of the renewal exercise for pesticides. And there are obligations which are relevant for applicants. And this is more linked to the content of the dossier. So the regulation clearly prescribes that the, uh, the applicant should provide a proposal for classification in the dossier in case the uh, substance should be classified or reclassified in accordance with the CRP regulation. So this is the basis. So the, we have to have something in the in the dossier coming from the applicant. Next slide, please. And then there are also clear obligations for the rapporteur member states when they are preparing the uh, assessment reports. In the Article 11, uh, Paragraph 9, it's clearly as stated that the rapporteur member states should submit the CLH report to ECA at the same, uh, at least at the same time when they are submitting the RAR to EFSA. So this is really clearly laying down the, the, the provisions that this is mandatory uh, uh, to address at the same time uh, during the renewal assessment of pesticides. Overall, the rapporteur has 13 months uh, after the submission of the dossier to prepare the RAR. And in particular, it, it has to contain information on the classification or confirmation or potential reclassification of the substance in the RAR, in the RAR, at least for the hazard classes which are mentioned in the regulation. And there are situations, for example, in case there are pending RACO proposals or, uh, uh, or an ECHO assessment is ongoing. In this case, uh, it is sufficient that uh, the rapporteur would limit the proposal to those hazard classes which are not covered by the pending RAC proposals unless, of course, new information have become available that, for, that were not part of the pending dossier at that time. And in case some of the hazard classes uh, are already covered by an existing classification or, or RAC opinion, uh, the rapporteur should provide a due justification that the existing classification, RAC opinion, or existing RAC, uh, ex existing uh, Annex 6 entry still remains valid. And in this situation, ECA may provide its view regarding the rapporteur member state's submission. Next slide, please. As regards uh, uh, obligations for the rapporteur member states, so it's clearly stated under a specific article in the regulation that ra the rapporteur should address specific hazard classes in the uh, in the RAR in the renewal assessment of active substances, and these are mostly linked to identify whether an active substance can be considered as a low risk active substance or whether it's linked really to one of the cutoff criteria which are described in the pesticides regulation, 
so most eminently related to uh, carcinogenicity, a germ cell mutagenicity or reproductive toxicity. But in addition, also rapporteurs should also address uh, uh, classification regarding uh, uh, classification criteria in respect to aquatic environment and so on. So you can see the list. It's clearly described and explicitly stated in the in the regulation, which has to be assessed by the rapporteur member state. And the rapporteur also should duly justify in case no harmonized classification and labeling is warranted for any of the hazard classes mentioned above, uh, for which they consider that the criteria for harmonized classification by the regulation would not be fulfilled. So in any case, uh, whenever there is no classification, we would need to see a due justification provided by the rapporteur member state in, in, in the report. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to obligations for applicants and member states, obviously there are clear uh, obligations indicated also for EFSA and, uh, and commission as risk managers in this new regulation. So in terms of EFSA, there is a, a definitive article saying that EFSA has to take account of the RAC opinion in, in the EFSA conclusion which should be established uh, in line with the with the EFSA procedures or within two weeks after adoption of the RAC opinion, if any, whichever occurs later. So this means that EFSA really has, has the obligation to take account not only the information and evidence provided during the, the EFSA pesticide speed review, but also uh, uh, the RAC opinion equally at the same time. So I think this is quite a strong uh, implication what, what we have in EFSA uh, based on this regulation. Also for ECA, we have a specific article clearly prescribing that the RAC uh, should endeavor to adopt the, the opinion within 13 months from the submission of the CLH report. So there is an indicative timeline already included in this regulation uh, with the aim to ensure that the RAC opinion would be available to EFSA prior to adoption of its conclusion. This is, I, I would like to highlight that this is an indicative timeline. However, this is already uh, uh, a step forward already to ensure that the two processes are aligned in a timely manner. And uh, lastly, also for commission as a decision maker at the last uh, uh, chain, there is a clear uh, provision saying that they need to take account the RAC opinion for the renewal report and the draft regulation when they are making any decision on the renewal or not of an active substance. So overall, uh, this uh, new implementing act on renewals ensures that the RAC opinion should be available both for EFSA prior to EFSA delivers its conclusion on the evaluation of the active substance of the Commission, but also to the Commission and Member States prior to the vote in the Standing Committee uh, in the decision making process. So I think this is quite a major step uh, uh, ahead, highlighting the importance of, of alignment of the both procedures and really the implication we have also for the decision making. Next uh, slide, please. In the next uh, uh, few slides, I just would like to highlight uh, the basic principles uh, of using the joint uh, DARA CLH report template, which have been basically developed jointly with member states, including ECA, and the final version have been published on the, uh, on the EC website in 2019. And as a key part of the alignment of the EPSA pesticide speed review process and the CLH processes, all the member states are really strongly advised to use this combined template when they are preparing the assessment reports to be submitted to both EPSA and ECA. And uh, they are also uh, strongly advised that this is submitted together and in parallel to both EPSA and ECA. 
Uh, this common template incorporates basically the CLH proposal into the volume one of the, of the DARRAR template, which is available on the, on the EC website, which you can see on this uh, slide. And the basic aim is to ensure that we have the same level of information in both the EFSA and ECA process to ensure uh, consolidated views, transparency and consistency in the data set for the two processes, as well as uh, to avoid duplication of work, which would be, res which would be resulting uh, from the need that the same level of information would be uh, needed to be uh, submitted in two different formats. For sure, the intention was to avoid that this duplication uh, uh, would need to be avoided. And overall, this joint format aimed to be fit for purpose for both the PPP and also at the same time for the CLH processes. And uh, that the same information should be covered uh, uh, in one document, basically relevant for both processes and thereby to facilitate the alignment of the two processes. Next slide, please. By having a joint template, uh, however, has some drawbacks and I just wanted to uh, highlight and kindly uh, raise the attention for all of you that uh, this joint format uh, should be considered as a compromise in terms of st structuring the information, which should be relevant for both the EFSA and ECA processes. And since there is no ideal solution in this case, it has to be accepted that there should be some redundancy and we have to live with this uh, and it has to be accepted in order to facilitate that reviewers of both processes could locate easily uh, the information that they would need. And we also need to accept the need for compromising between the format which would be prepared by the RAC reporters or, or which would be needed basically by the risk assessors in the pesticide process. And that's why uh, there is a need to apply a certain flexibility uh, when filling in this uh, in this template, uh, because indeed we need to include all information in this uh, template, which is necessary for both processes, even though it might be that some of the uh, information could be relevant only for one or the other processes. As mentioned before, using this uh, same report, the joint report for both regulatory processes is aiming to increase the transparency of the data of the assessment of the classification uh, purposes and to facilitate preparation of assessments uh, that would allow uh, an independent review in both processes. So, in fact, even if there is no proposal for classification or uh, you don't see the need to revise the current harmonized classi classification in place for a different, for a specific hazard class, it is proposed that the comparison with the CLP criteria should always be presented. And this is basically to allow a transparent conclusion to be drawn. Next slide, please. And uh, the general principles of the common template, uh, I would like to mention that volume one is the, is, is the core in this case, especially for harmonized classification and labeling, since all information specific for classification should be included in the volume uh, one level two of the document. In particular, this document contains the overall summaries and the overview of the conclusions uh, which have been reached in the risk assessment uh, for the representative uses uh, uh, for the product in the peer review process, but also it should contain at the same time the pro proposal for the classification. So in the level two, there should be the standard summaries in line with the effects data which are required for the exposure and risk assessment in the approval renewal process at EPSA, with the classification sections uh, uh, which should be added additionally. And uh, I would like to highlight that for the classification process, since this volume one is equivalent to the CLH dossier, it should be as much as possible to be a standalone document. So basically all information needed for the assessment of the study should be included in the volume one. 
for classification purposes, while uh, the volume three should include additional data, which would allow in-depth uh, assessment or further clarification, which might be needed. And the preferred format is already uh, as indicated in the template. Reporters are invited to provide tabular overviews uh, for each uh, section, subsection, and hazard class in question. In particular, with the robust study summaries uh, and the hazard class in question, which should include uh, the overall relevance, uncertainty of the provided data, or significance of any deviations from guidelines. And uh, uh, it's important also to note that for classification purposes, all effects should be discussed. So not only the ones which are relevant for the NOAL or endpoint settings uh, uh, for the peer review process. And standardly, there is a need also to include the comparison of the results with the CRP classification criteria and uh, a conclusion on classification and labeling for the hazard class in question in line with the CRP criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, as mentioned above, so it's very crucial that information should cover all the effects uh, observed at all those levels, and uh, it should address both the setting of the endpoints NOAS, LOAS for the peer review process, as well as all needs for classification. And that's why overall the study summary should contain sufficient information to assess uh, the acceptability of the studies, as well as the reliability of the studies. And uh, to accommodate the RAC needs, I think it is also recommended to indicate uh, the magnitude and direction of the change, statistical significance in these tables. There is a bit of example provided in this, uh, in this slide for a reference. Cross-reference can be obviously uh, applied whenever needed in the volume one to volume three, because indeed the volume three of the RAR should provide more details, more extended results and summaries of, of the studies, and this, this should be presented clearly and transparently in the volume three. Uh, and overall, the aim is that all the endpoints should be described with a sufficient level of details to allow a proper and transparent assessment, both by the EFSA pesticides peer review and by the RAC uh, in the CLH process. Next slide, please. So once the uh, combined RR CLH template is submitted to the agencies to ECA and EFSA, the next step is basically uh, that uh, an accordance and completeness check uh, will be undertaken by both EPSA and ECA signs, and this is harmonized in a timely manner between the two agencies. The aim is basically to uh, uh, launch a joint consultation uh, uh, parallel on both websites for a common duration of 60 days, and it's important to highlight that uh, this can be done only once the documents uh, are completely final. So basically, the accordance check and the completeness check uh, is uh, finalized, including the re-evaluation of the updated documents following the resubmission by the member states. And in this process, uh, we rely really on the compliance of member states. This is really crucial so that we can launch a public consultation on both ECA and EFSA sites in a timely manner. So that's why we, uh, we really uh, uh, rely on, on your timely uh, compliance in, in this process. This is really a crucial step to start both processes. In terms of sanitization before publication, I wanted to highlight that this is done by EFSA in case there is a common DARA CLH report submitted. So EFSA will check the sanitization claims submitted by the applicants and uh, uh, this will be the basis for the public consultation, but only once uh, this is completely uh, finalized following completion of the 
accordance, check at ECA side, and also the completeness check at EFSA side. And uh, in this case, there will be no need for any further check by ECA or the member state competent authorities regarding the sanitization requests. So it will be quite straightforward and uh, the, the public consultation can be lined subsequently. Also in the onboard steps uh, uh, following the public consultation, there is a, a close collaboration maintained between ECA and EFSA. So this means that basically ECA is involved in all main steps and milestones of the peer review. Uh, like for example, during the comment evaluation phase, ECA is generally systematically invited to take part in the kickoff teleconference where we discuss the main actions needed in the pesticides peer review process. But also uh, EFSA is trying to regularly follow the RAC discussions and at the same time also ECA is systematically invited to, to participate in the EFSA pesticides peer review express meetings. So we will try to harmonize and really try to align the process from the beginning until the end to ensure the integrity of, the pro of both processes. Next slide please. And uh, in the last part of the presentation, just to give you a few uh, links to relevant guidances and templates which are available for both applicants submitting PPP dossiers or also for presentation of the CLH dossier, CLH data in the dossier and assessment reports. And there is the ECA guidance, the guidance on the application on CLP criteria from July 2027. 20, uh, which should be considered uh, when drafting the volume one of the of the DAR and RAR and uh, including all required information in comparison with the CRP criteria. Uh, there is obviously this practical guide on how to submit CLH dossiers, which were, uh, was published quite recently this year, uh, in which where there is a dedicated chapter on pesticides in chapter six. So if you, you can also pay attention to this one, that would be very helpful. And uh, there are also uh, basically all the guidance is relevant for the pesticide process are available on the ECA and the EC website uh, together with the combined uh, DARA CLH report template. So I provided the link here in this presentation, uh, which, which can be used uh, for further reference. And also, I would like to mention the EFSA administrative guidance on the submission of dossiers and assessment reports for peer review of pesticide active substances. This is uh, equally applicable for both applicants and rapporteur member states, and it has been uh, revised in March this year to take into account already the transparency regulation and the new provisions coming from it. And uh, in particular, it could be helpful to check the sections uh, uh, regarding the assessment and presentation of the studies or the guidance on the presentation of the results of the studies, which I think can be very helpful for, uh, for presenting uh, uh, the data in the correct format and manner. And finally, uh, along these uh, guidances, uh, there is also pre-submission support offered by both ECA uh, to discuss the CLH report before its submission and also by EFSA side. So there is in place some already some uh, uh, based on some current practice that uh, uh, rapporteurs are invited to contact EFSA uh, during the pre-submission phase, during the assessment uh, phase, uh, during the preparation of the RAR in case they encounter some complex issues and they would need some technical advice or support from EFSA so they can do so before submitting their R, their R to EFSA. This is also described in the EFSA administrative guidance specifically. Next slide please. And finally, some uh, useful links for IOCLID. So basically, IUCLID is the uh, is the new system for the data pre preparation for the electronic submission and management of pesticide dossiers. 
and this is by, managed by the Hacker Cloud Services. So all applications submitted uh, as of 27th of March 2021 must be submitted using the IUCLIT format uh, uh, as an electronic submission format. And you can see some useful links which could be helpful, I think, also for preparation of, of the RAR and CNH report. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see the, the latest release of IOCLID 6.6 .6 from October 2021. You can see the link here provided in this presentation with the details about uh, what has changed compared to the uh, previous version, which includes, for example, revised uh, uh, OECD harmonized templates and so on. And also we have a, as a, a helpful tool for you, probably the uh, user manual, the IUCL user manual for the PPP active substances. Uh, this will be updated uh, in the next uh, coming days, I think, to be in line with really the latest release of the IUCL 6.6. And uh, it could be also helpful to see the IUCLID crosswalks, which is basically the mapping from the old CADI dossier, the KCA, KCP dossier, compared to the uh, IUCLID uh, dossier content. And finally, some links regarding IUCLID training for regulators, which took place uh, recently and some uh, uh, supporting materials, webinars and training sessions recorded on the EFSA website. So you can use this uh, as, as for your reference as you wish. And also, as I mentioned, that we would like to receive basically uh, the data in tabular format. I just wanted to highlight that we have also detailed instructions and templates uh, for the presentation of results of studies in tabular format available in the IUCLID user manual, but also uh, via the EFSA Knowledge Junction uh, platform. I provided the link in this presentation for easier reference. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide from our side, just basically an outlook for the developments that we will foresee with the IUCLID. And uh, in terms of this, uh, there is a dedicated pesticide steering network subgroup on IOCLID, uh, uh, which has been established uh, in particular to be involved in the further development uh, of the features and the tools which could further advance the pesticide dossier processing. You can see the relevant terms of reference and membership uh, already published on the EFSA website. We already have, I think, uh, 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 members from 11 uh, member states uh, in this group. Minutes and uh, presentations and all relevant materials are available on the EFSA website. You can see also the contact email address in case you need any further uh, advice or details on this issue, or you can just uh, channel basically your questions via your members, uh, member state who would participate in this uh, uh, pesticide uh, subgroup uh, on IOC lead because there is a dedicated uh, Teams channel uh, to, to provide uh, communication items on this respect. And what I would like to highlight, uh, which, which is of relevance for classification and labeling, that uh, the aim is in the medium and long term plan basically that uh, pending on further IOCLID developments, uh, the idea is to use the report generator to create this combined R and uh, RAR CLH report uh, uh, in the future. So basically it means that the, the combined R CLH report, which is aiming to cover both processes, that could be generated directly from IOCLID dossier once we will get uh, uh, to the step that the report generator could fit with the layout of the template. The work is uh, still ongoing and uh, for the moment I'm not able to, to provide any details on this, but uh, this is the plan, this is the intention and we hope that uh, uh, with these developments, basically, uh, this could be really used for both uh, the EFSA and the ECA regulatory purposes. 
And in case uh, you have any questions, for example, in particular on the report generator for the CLH report, you can contact uh, uh, this email address mentioned here below under ioclid.servicemanager at efsa.europa.eu. So with this, I think I'm finalizing my uh, presentation. I hope this can be helpful and we remain available for any further questions you may have with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tunde and the EFSA colleagues. Very thorough, very clear explanation of the integration of PPP and CLH. So lots of good principles and tips there in the slides that people can refer back to. Um, we're a little bit pressed for time, but I think we could maybe take one question. Kiara can read it out, and maybe Tunde, you could try to answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so we just received one uh, question from the uh, audience. I'm going to read it out. Uh, just a, just a second. Okay. As, unless I miss it, how is other non-public data besides that of the past, uh, per, uh, plant protection po uh, the applicant, example, for rich registration dossier ensured to be considered and reported in the combined document? Was it clear, Tunde? Could you answer or do you want it again? Since we don't, since you don't see what is the real question, I don't know whether it could be possible to to re reread it. Yes, unless I miss it, how is other non-public data beside that of the plant protection product applicant, for example, data from the rich registra mm -hmm. uh, registration dossier, ensure to be considered and reported in the combined document? I guess the, the question if you have a substance, I mean, how I understand if you have a substance that is um, both registered as rich substance and as a pesticide, how the data in the rich registration will be considered in the, uh, in the DAR, if I understand the question correctly. So if I understood the question correctly, for us, once the dossier, once the RAR comes to EFSA, basically based on the applicant's dossier, for us it's by default that we are checking whatever is available at EU level or beyond, any assessments, any available regulatory decision or any processes in, in, in place or ongoing for the same substance. So we regularly also monitor the ECA website during the scientific check that we are doing in EFSA. So in case we see there is really a rich registration or something ongoing, we take this into account in the scientific check. And if needed, we make a comment accordingly to raise also this with the reporter member states. So indeed, we are not working in isolation when we are uh, doing the assessment of the approval or renewal of active substances. So we are really trying to see, it's very crucial to see if there are any relevant assessments available from EFSA or ECA or from other sites beyond, even if it's a notification via rich dossier. So I think from our side, I can confirm that by default, we are checking uh, uh, if there is any anything notified to, to the ECA website and we are trying to take this on board. But also, I think the reporters probably are doing the same while they are preparing the assessments reports. Thanks very much, Tunde. Um, just in, in the interest of time, I think we should move. We're about 20 minutes late, so I'll pass straight to Gesine Muller uh, from ECHA, who's going to talk about the biocides process. So, Gesine, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for, for the brief introduction. I had problems to unmute myself, but now it's working. Thanks a lot for this also. Um, yeah, I will talk a bit about the biocide process and, and the interlink with CLH, and maybe um, we can have a look at the next slide. Yeah, this, this outlines um, the content of the brief presentation I'm going to give. 
um, the biocide and CLH interlink, and I will explain why it's so important for us for the biocides to have the, the substances classified. It really impacts significantly the, the approval process. And then um, I will move to the combined CLH card template. And last but not least, I will address the complicated issue of classifying in situ generated active substances. We received quite a lot of questions regarding this. Next slide, please. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, this, this is the legal basis, which is, um, has also been um, presented by, by our um, EFSA colleagues. Um, it refers, um, the first paragraph refers to the CLP regulation where it says a substance that is an active substance. And here it still refers to the directive, to the biocidal directive, but what is meant is we the, we the biocidal active substance shall normally be subject to harmonious classification and labeling. And further information on the need to classify uh, can be found in the, in the biocide review program regulation. And that's a bit more specific uh, because for substances meeting the exclusion and substitution criteria, the, the competent authority um, should submit a proposal for harmonized classification and labeling to the agency um, and for, for the endpoints of concern. Um, while um, the, the, the right to, to submit um, a proposal also for other or all endpoints is, is, is still um, reserved. So um, um, there, there can be um, very extended CLH proposals and, and we um, basically would encourage this also. Can we have a look at the next slide, please? Thanks a lot. So, um, Endpoints of concern in respect of exclusion and substitution criteria. Um, um, this refers to CMR um, 1A, 1B properties, so the carcinogenicity, the mutagenicity, and the toxicity for, um, for the reproduction is, um, is relevant. And the classification 1A or 1B would result um, in, ex in exclusion. Um, and the, whereas the respiratory sensitizer, um, those substances would be candidate for substitution. Can we have the next slide, please? So what's the classification, the consequences for the classification if a substance meets the exclusion criteria, those substances shall not be approved. So they should not be placed on the market as a biocidal product, basically, unless, and there are conditions which can be fulfilled, um, the derogations where approval is still possible. And this is um, if the risk from exposure is negligible or if the active substance is essential to prevent or control a serious danger or if not approving of the active substance would have a disproportionate negative impact on the society. Next slide, please. And there are also consequences um, for, for the classification in, um, in regard to the substitution criteria. Um, active substances shall be considered as candidate for substitution if, um, if the substance meets at least one of the exclusion criteria, and this refers to the CMR 1A, 1B property, but one of the derogations apply because these substances still can be approved. Um, and substituted should be also substances which meets the, um, which are classified as respiratory sensitizer. And the agency, agency um, ECA um, shall um, examine whether the active substance fulfills the substitution criteria um, when preparing the BPC opinion or on the um, approval, and that means basically that pointed out in, in the regulation that um, um, the agency needs to launch a public consultation um, to investigate whether there are candidates for substitution, and that needs to be done within this really very short period of 270 days for the peer review of the biocidal active substance, because as soon as the cry is submitted, there are only 270 days for, for drafting the, the BPC opinion. Next slide, please. The classification has also consequences on, um, on the eligibility of a simplified authorization procedure. Um, 
this is a specific procedure which allows the applicant to submit a very limited data package. Um, it has also um, an implication on, on granting um, the product authorization because for some for products with a specific classification, um, the the authorization for the general public uh, it cannot be granted. So the harmless classification has also an implications on the product authorization. Next slide, please. So what all, all what is what is um, in the legal text um, needs has a, has an, an effect on on the procedure um, which had to be um, developed. So it has an implication um, on the approval process, and this here is how it's reflected in the working procedure. Um, the it's a substitution criteria are met because of CMR properties. Um, it is really highly preferred and it is really strongly recommended that the RAC opinion um, on the classification is available at the time of submitting the car. And this is a challenge because it means um, that the CLH dossier needs to be submitted during the evaluation phase while the active substance is still within the, with the um, ECA in evaluation and RAC has actually 18 months for developing the opinion. So that means the CLH dossier should have been submitted a year, to one and a half, two years before the car submission is planned. And this, this we understand this is, this is difficult and this challenges and we are working hard to, to achieve this together with the member states. But in any case, the CLH dossier needs to have been submitted uh, by the time of submitting the car. But um, um, I think it, it's clear now that th this is if the CLH dossier for substance is meeting the exclusion criteria, this has an implication on um, on um, on the um, approval decision and proposal of the BPC opinion. Next slide, please. Um, substances which do not meet exclusion, substi um, exclusion substitution criteria are also those um, substances um, um, a CLH dossier should be submitted. And this is always the case if a change is proposed in the already existing harmonized classification or also if there is no harmonized classification available currently in, in the of this active substance, then in these cases, the CLH dossier should have been submitted by the time of submitting the car. And um, the ECA conducts an accordance check for, for the cars. And um, it is actually one of the criteria to, to accept the car um, for the peer review if this CLH dossier is, is available, um, the car can be, it, it meets also the other criteria, of course, which are checked, then it can enter the peer review. We have a specific um, situation for substances which are proposed for MUTA 2 classification. Uh, for those, um, the RAC opinion on the CLH should also be available at the time of submitting the car. Um, similar to the exclusion criteria. And this is uh, due to the fact that the risk characterization um, may result in very ex uh, restrictive um, exposure um, situations if the um, if the identity if no threshold of safety can be identified. So the exposure really should be minimized and that um, should be known by um, during the process of, of the BBC opinion drafting. Next slide, please. We, of course, um, in analogy to the, to the um, pesticide activities, we, th there is, exists also a combined a template, a combined CAR CLH report template. 
um, to, to facilitate these two processes, the CLP and the BPR process, and also to really to facilitate the work of the evaluating competent authority and, and the CLH dossier submitter, because we have the situation that in within the member states, the the competent authority or the agency dealing with the bias side um, evaluation is not always identical to the, to the authority in the member states dealing with the, with the um, preparation of the CLH dossier. So, um, so this um, combined template is, is really um, to avoid duplication of work and to save time and to save resources. And also should ensure the transparency and also the, the, the consistency between these two processes. Um, the combined template uh, consists basically or incorporates actually the CLH proposal and, and the competent authority uh, um, report. It can also be used for the renewal authority report. Um, this means that the template can be separated into different reports in the CAR or RA and in the CLH report. And this is very much an analog what what you just heard from um, from the combined template, which is used for um, for the pesticide process. So it's really strongly recommended. Um, to our biocides competent authority to use this combined CAR CLH template in, in the preparation of the CAR or of the RA. Um, and you find the, um, the template available even twice on the ECHA web page. And here, here are the links. You have the, um, the, the template under the CLP templates, and you find them also under the BPR templates on the ECHA web page. Next slide, please. So this here is a bit an overview on 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 the um, on the parts of the combined car. So you find specific instruction in the in the first few pages on the on the template on the combined car template, and you see here first the car. Um, we have um, a summary. The car consists of a summary of part A, B, C, and D with the appendixes, and for the CLH report. Um, relevant are the parts with the summary, the part A, the part five of the appendix five of part D with the references, and the appendix seven of part D, um, which includes the study summaries. Next slide, please. Important for um, to recognize is really um, that the CLH dossier should be a standalone. A document because this is all the information included there should be um, in such quality that that it can be assessed independent independently and it may not must be made available for um, or must be fit for for a public consultation that means um, there should not be confidential information included. Um, and the legal requirements under CLP um, uh, are in such way that the CLH report should also include um, relevant data from the which registration dossier and also data um, which are available under the, the pesticide regulation and also um, data available from public sources or so public literature should be included also to facilitate the CLH um, decision. Um, and since the CL CLP regulation um, um, includes also um, the, the the need to to, um, to perform a rate of evidence approach, so um, um, there might be the need also to have not only clearly positive, but a, a good weighing of the data. So also um, negative data um, might be necessary to include, but I think our CLH colleagues can um, can comment on this much better in detail. Next slide, please. We have the situation under the biocide regulation that we actually have active substances which are also regulated under REACH, 
and they are also regulated under pesticide. And not always the same member states, member states take care on, on the active substance as a pesticide and, and the biocide. That means we really need a collaboration among the member states. We need a collaboration among the legislations. Uh, and we also need the collaboration among the agencies within the different member states, because um, for the CLH process, there should be really only one CLH submitted per substance. And this is a challenge. Um, and we, um, from the biocide unit, we, um, we, we really try to support the member states and um, raise awareness if we know that the substance is not only a biocide but also a pesticide we we try to to coordinate um the the uh, and facilitate the process and, and the communication among the member states um we are, we are aware that the combined template um has challenges because there needs to be submitted for the CLH process, additional information, maybe also visual control data, maybe data also on individual individual animals, um, more details on how proper study summaries, for example, can be um, reported, can be found in the um, practical guide three and the practical guide three. Next slide, please. This is not a very different topic, and the reason why uh, why we bring this up is in situ generated active substances. This is a bit of speciality of, of the um, of the biocide um, regulation. These are substances which, as the name says, generated in situ. Then they are generated at the place of use from one or more precursor, and we receive a lot of questions. Um, on, on how how the how these substances can be can be classified and if they need to be classified, and the answer is simply yes. There is an obligation to classify active substances, which are also generated in 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 C two uh, in the same way as the uh, application of, um, applies for for all other vital active substances. And the reason is um, it is just um, the classification criteria are really uh, important um, because we, it needs to be clear whether this also the in situ generated active substance meets the exclusion substitution criteria or whether it's eligible for, for um, listed to be Annex 1 or um, for the product authorization later. It's important to, to know whether the products can be placed on the market also for the general public. Next slide, please. Many of the in situ generated active substances can be reactive and can be unstable, but there are also um, substances which are more stable and, and, and they really can be placed on the market in a stable form. And they are also um, normally a really pro a precursor, and we receive oft often the, the questions regarding the precursors. And the precursors, they are normally they are considered as a biocidal product. And the question we received is, for example, uh, uh, for example, is uh, when is a harmonized classification on the in situ generated active substances needed? And this, the answer is. Um, Pretty clear, maybe also pretty obvious when you think of it. The harmonized classification needs to be proposed on the in situ generated substances for all the endpoints for which it is possible to perform the related first chemical uh, toxicological or ecotox tests. And for endpoints for which a test cannot be for performed, it's very difficult to classify those for those endpoints if there is no data on, on which classification could, could be done. The related CLH dossier um, uh, to, to, to establish such a, such a harmonized classification must be submitted in, in, in due time as in the same way as, as to any, any other biocidal active substance. Next slide, please. We also received the question whether 
harmless classification on the precursor are needed. Um, and this is the precursor is not is not the active substance. So principally, no, it's not really mandatory for accepting the car when it's except it has been submitted to ECA. Um, so it's not an element which will be taken into account, but the ECA may well submit a CLH dossier for the precursor, and this information on the on the harmonious classification then later when the RAC opinion um, is adopted, this this can be very helpful and very useful and really facilitate the product authorization stage, um, and it will be of course. Um, considered for the product authorization um, since a precursor is considered uh, in normally uh, as, um, as a product. Um, so the related classification of the uh, of the precursor can prevent the making available on on, on, on um, dangerous substances for the for the um, general public. And it also um, can help managing substances under reach or, or under under other chemical legislations. I think that was the last slide. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm open for questions, of course. Thanks very much, Gazina. Very clear again, a presentation on the interlinks between biocides and CLH. And thanks for answering, answering sorry, uh, some questions already in your presentation. Uh, okay, we better move because we haven't much time left. Um, apologies to, to Nicholas and Joka, the next speakers, but uh, I won't need too much time at the end for the closing, so you can use most of the time. Um, so we move straight to, to Joka and Nicholas for the read across presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome everybody to the last talk of the session. Uh, Nicholas couldn't make it, but I hope I'll cover well enough for him. Now, how to submit a harmonized classification labeling dossier part two, how to support grouping and read across. I will answer mostly to the content of the scientific content here, not to the procedural aspects of that question. Um, so, that works very nice. This talk in a nutshell, just in case you need to move, uh, you need to leave early. Um, two parts. First is increasing the confidence in using Read Across. I would like to share a few concepts with you that hopefully serve to uh, lower the threshold that uh, some colleagues seem to have when dealing with Read Across as it being one uncertainty among many. Then the focus. Uh, on the driver of toxicity and the mechanism that is behind the toxicity as a critical element when assessing and building also a read across case. And the key element that supporting data is key to success. In terms of practical advice, the key message would be that you can use the read across assessment framework to make your cases more robust, but this is not an obligation. It needs not to be fulfilled strictly, and I have a couple of examples on that, because and this is a little spoiler, uh, most classification cases attempt to read across a known hazard and not the absence of effects, as is the case for most cases for which the read across assessment framework was developed. Now, if I can entertain you with a couple of pictures. I studied chemistry in the city of Wuppertal where more than 120 years ago, aspirin and heroin were discovered both acetylations of natural derived plant extracts, and that's about all the structural similarity that you can get, and I would not advise reading a cross between them. Uh, following with macromolecular chemistry in the US, and then moving on into, uh, into toxicology assessment, apologies. Um, first at the German Cancer Research Center, uh, preparing a PhD thesis in molecular toxicology and chemical carcinogenesis, and then moving on to the field of regulatory toxicology at the BFR and here at ECA. Now I raise this because for a long time I thought that my studies of chemistry were the ticket into the big world of toxicology and I was not using my chemistry knowledge so much until about five years ago when colleagues found out that the two combined experiences make for a relatively sound assessment uh, of seeing through read across cases, both deconstructing them at, but well, if you reverse engineer the principles, it can also be possible that you have some ideas about how to build them. 
So main message here, if you want to build a read across case, see that you get the necessary expertise around the table in your team. Overview of my talk. Basically just five things. We have a problem, why don't we test everything? We have a couple of uncertainties to deal with. I propose a solution here and hopefully give some practical advice on how to build a case covered with a few examples and then we conclude. Why do we do safety testing at all? I need not go much into detail for this audience. Basically, it comes down to having a scientific basis, which are educated estimations for managing risks. And if we look at the past 54 years, since Directive e, uh, EWG 45467 was passed, um, approximately 1,200 substances have been possible to assign to the green circles here, which are either we know about the risk and it is well managed, or there is no risk, or the risk management is ongoing, uh, thanks to the brilliant efforts um, in this room and your rooms. On the other hand, we have a percentage of a thousand substance, well, well, we have a thousand percent in relation to that, a factor of 10, one order of magnitude um, of substances that we are not yet clear yet on where in these buckets they fall. So there's data generation ongoing, risk management under consideration, or the largest one, they're not yet assigned. How do we crack this for the next 54 years, or maybe even faster? We changed the whole question why safety testing to why do we use read across? And it's basically the same answer, except that through using read across, we can optimize the use of resources and especially time through apply applying more of our scientific method. Uh, I advocate that read across is just one uncertainty more among the many uncertainties we deal with, and I go into that in my next slide, or in my next section. So, please bear with me as I develop this slide from the bottom up. When we look at mixture toxicity, where I will not go into detail, we have a factor of somewhere between one to tenfold that uh, the uncertainty could be attributed to. It could be more if it's multiplicatory, it could be less. Um, the next one, I will not even try to assign any uncertainty when we go from animal to human extrapolation or from human to human extrapolation, fetal enzyme status to teenage enzyme status to adult enzyme status or the toxicodynamics that certain substances will exert in these life stages of an organism and also not the strain and species differences in animals, but you get the idea. The next one is very limited statistical power of OECD test guidelines. Now, some of you might object. We have the test guidelines, they're very good, yes. But if you ask a seasoned biostatistician of an animal group of n equals 10, or if we take the carcinogenicity study, even n equals 50, if you take any result of that, you will not be able to fit a Gauss curve through many of those. So discuss with a biostatistician and just assign a certain uncertainty to this. The experimentation variability going from one lab to the other, sometimes even from one assessor to the, uh, from one uh, experiment, experimentator in the same lab to the other um, is, is another issue. Um, pathologists are highly skilled people and I think the laboratories that employ them seek that they stay uh, in healthy and in good condition. Um, when we look at biovariability, I was recently told that biovariability bio alone can be up to 300%, factor of three. Not quite an order of magnitude, but I was stunned by, the re by, by that remark. Usually it's a bit less, but biovariability is a big issue here. Now last but not least, when looking at read across, we have to distinct, uh, we have to differentiate between two general modes of action, and one being the receptor-based uh, mechanism uh, where we are mostly concerned about when we for, look, for instance, at developmental toxicity, where it can be a factor of one, but it can also be a factor of 100,000 uh, difference in binding affinity when you introduce only one additional methyl group. Every pharmacologist will be able to tell you that. And then we look at read across, which is done on substances where the chemical, where the structural similarity uh, may not play such a large role because the mechanism behind it is general cell stress. I will develop that in one of the next slides. And what I would like to show here and highlight is that while most of us are pretty 
familiar with the bottom part of this iceberg through their training and through their uh, experience, I have the impression that the tip of the iceberg with read across and the additional uncertainties is more scaring than the rest. And yeah, I would advocate that we give this a critical look and possibly uh, reconsider. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that I'm not leaning towards either way in accepting or rejecting a really cross based on a certain mechanism. I'm just saying try to gauge all the different uncertainties that are in a certain case and then decide. Coming to biovariability, I sometimes hear the toxicity profiles are different and then the conclusion, so the read across fails. Yes, in most cases that is the case, but we should ask ourselves, is it truly differences in the toxicity profiles or are we looking here at biovariability because we have only a lim limited data set? And what I would then encourage is to look a little wider, look a little in the chemical neighborhood and see what other substances just like it uh, whether they have similar toxicity profiles and how the toxicity profile checks out, for instance, for a whole category. Now, across a category, one, of course, needs to watch out for trend breaks, but I'll come to that later. There has been a publication by who is now director at the US EPA for computational toxicology, Russell Thomas, who, with his team, looked at more than 1,000 substances in almost 1,000 essays, coming from different sectors of use. And they had interesting findings in that the activity, like I already mentioned a bit, can be divided into specific biomolecular interactions that are, for instance, receptor specific. And on the other hand, related to general cell stress, uh, being due to metabolic overload, being due to chemical reactivity with certain, I don't know, membranes, proteins, physical chemical properties. And the other outcome was that there was a correlation. So the active substances generally could be attributed to the type 1 toxicity, which is, for instance, receptor specific, whereas industrial chemicals were mainly of the general cell stress type toxicity. Of course, some are also attributable to the type 1 receptor specific, but that was the general picture. And the concentration difference in the concentrations used in these bioassays were by a factor of 100 and more, which is easily explained because if you look at a substance that has a hormonal activity, we all know that this is active at much lower concentrations than, say, a substituted fatty acid, which then may lead to metabolic overload and further consequences. I'll take you back one bit and uh, take a layman's view. What is really cross to begin with? Now, this boy is trying to attempt his read across on the starfishes. And if we give a little bit of a playful uh, angle to this and think which of these sports items are most similar and why, then we can not only ask ourselves uh, concerning surface and weight and density and size of the balls, but also the rules that are behind it, the number of players. Uh, and when it comes to risk assessment, the maximum velocity with which these are thrown or punched or whatever, and the potential impact and risk that comes from that. Now, I mention this because when presenting to uh, registrants' audiences, I usually bring this slide which tries to uh, do away with a certain misconception that coming from a hypothesis, you can predict the properties and take the consequences, and some don't take the consequences. But the misconception is that you definitely need some justification, you need a justification, and you need some experimental evidence. And the more you want to predict, and with more, I mean, absence of effects, then the better your overall approach needs to be, and the more angles you need to cover, uh, and the more robust the data needs to be. When you instead want to predict a hazardous effect, which is known for one category member and for which the data is not there for the other category members, then the threshold can be much lower. Uh, you may still cover all the angles that are described in the read across assessment framework, but for some of us, uh, we would not regard this as being very efficient. Now we can blow up this whole scheme and try to look at all the different angles, but I rather aim 
to simplify things and give you a couple of uh, step by step uh, to follow how to build a read across case. I already mentioned start by getting the necessary expertise to the table, get a chemist, get, get somebody with a chemistry uh, background, get somebody with a toxicology and ecotoxicology background, depending on the endpoint you have. And if you're doing a first read across case, I would say a general advice is starting simple is good in life. And here it would be, um, no, I go into that on the next slide, sorry. So you start with the starting point of a seed substance with a known hazard and then develop either your hypothesis or based on the structural analogs and the data you get from there. Um, so two and three in this sequence are interchangeable. Um, very important is identifying information that supports the hypothesis. Without supporting information, usually of an experimental type, uh, and it can be very old experiments. It can be from the first half of the last century, and then it's already textbook knowledge. Um, but usually experimental evidence supports a hypothesis, and that's what we call scientific method, before predicting the properties, both in a qualitative and in a quantitative manner. Going a little more into detail, I already spoiled it myself, start simple. If you can, identify a group of substances where you can do a salt-based read across. Uh, start with the category that was built by a registrant, and that is maybe a little better than some categories for which we consider that the read across is not robust enough. Or build on the outcome of a group management team effort that ECHA has recently conducted. I already mentioned the textbook known, for instance, rapid and complete hydrolysis, even though sometimes that is really just a textbook example and not so uh, real life reality test solid. Then go ahead and search the chemical neighborhood, either manually or by using a functionality in the QSAR toolbox, which will generate uh, or identify, not generate, but identify the immediate chemical neighbors of your substance. And I would usually say, try to go in, in circles. If you have a certain number of substances and they have enough information that support your hypothesis, it's fine to stop there. But usually having a broader view initially and being able to filter and refine at a later stage is not such a bad idea. The hypothesis usually comes one, from one of two scenarios, one being that the, substance, the substances are transformed biologically or by chemical breakdown to a common compound, and then this common compound is what drives the toxicity. Or the other is that different substances, very similar but still different, substances have the same type and sometimes also strength of effects. And the different scenarios in the read across assessment framework develop or guide a scaffold on whether it is a trend or whether it is a worst case uh, consideration. When you look at this, gathering the supporting information, I would say look at the whole chemical neighborhood if you have a data poor scenario uh, and keep it to the most relevant neighbors when you have a data rich scenario. Um, reports from other authorities can be useful and when building on the registrant's efforts to avoid testing, uh, it may be a good idea to see what, how, how reliable the, the reading class of the registrant uh, is in the first place. But on the other hand, I have a, an, an example that, that uh, says there is no harm in having a read, having a read across classification first and have the registrant figure it out whether the, the substance actually has this or not later on. When looking at the two different types of scenarios for the hypothesis and how to support these, biotransformation scenarios are typically supported by data on the hydrolysis or from toxicokinetic studies whereas same type of effect scenarios are usually supported by a comparison of the toxicity profiles. And for that, you need some information, usually across the whole toxicity profile and all the different endpoints. Um, very useful are bridging studies in the form of lower tier information, 28 day study when you look at a 90 day information requirement or, or a chronic study, reproductive screening study when you look at prenatal developmental tox study or extended one repro study. And then last but not least, try to predict not only qualitatively, but 
I would advocate also quantitatively. Of course, there can be trend breaks. If we look at the homolog series of linear and alkanes, hexane, N-hexane is a trend breaker in that it causes peripheral nerve damage, nerve damage axonopathies. And this is not true for the direct uh, neighbors and also not for any of the others. So it does not mean that the reading class automatically fails. Try to address this, why the evidence might seem to contradict the hypothesis. Um, sometimes the, the hypothesis needs to be modified when, when not corroborated by the experimental data. In some cases, it may mean that this particular reading class uh, is, is not robust enough. Um, as a bonus, I would, I would say that discussing the uncertainty added by the reading class to the uncertainties that are already mentioned gives the downstream audience, the, the audience that you directed to, a certain idea or a better idea of um, how big the error margins are that we want to attribute here. And it then also comes down to whether one is on the conservative and cautious side for accepting this read across and going for the classification, or whether there's uh, actually a certain lenient or liberal approach when rejecting this read across. Um, yes. So read across is used in approximately 75% of registrations, and I would encourage you to use that to the extent possible. Um, and last but not least, when using the RAF for classification, I already said that it does not need to be fulfilled strictly. And I say this because uh, by principle of analogy, there are many entries already classified which would never fulfill the read across assessment framework's most basic conditions. For instance, having chemical structural similarity in the first place. Uh, the vitamin K analog anticoagulants are dissimilar across the board. Um, and many entries, such as the petroleum-based uh, entries to the CLP annex, would probably fail on the basis of substance ID and test material identification. But again, this is a change of perspective when trying to predict hazardous properties as opposed to trying to predict an absence of effects for the purpose of filling information requirements under reach. It is very useful to increase the robustness of the case because you can work along the scaffold that the read-across assessment framework provides and see what uncertainties you still have. Um, and it was designed for assisting our assessment under reach for absence of effects cases. Now the basic questions, not only for the animals, but also for the assessors is, is the read-across acceptable or not? And I try to fish out a few examples uh, at the end even though this was not the best week or month uh, of the year to go this deep. So in terms of receptor-mediated read across the anticoagulants, vitamin K analogs definitely work by having a receptor antagonism. They are dissimilar in structure, but they have a common stereoelectronic feature in that they fill the same receptor binding pocket, which is their mode of action. And of course, for uh, the use purposes, they need to have similarities in their toxicokinetic properties, and the similarities in toxicodynamic properties are evident. Looking at similar structure, and we could also argue that this is actually transformation into common compounds, uh, there are several examples such as the cadmium salts and the lead compounds where salt-based read across is the driver, in that, they had, in that the hypothesis is the cations are the driver of toxicity, uh, the supporting evidence is based on numerous in vivo studies, higher tier in vivo studies with selected uh, representative compounds of these types of metals. Um, they're all soluble, the ones uh, for which the classification has been enacted, and the prediction is the extrapolation of effects based on the solubilization of the cation, so basically physical chemical effects. And last one is uh, dioptilton octanoate, where in more than 10 years ago, there was a read across for purposes of filling standard information requirements based on dioctyltin dichloride. So DOTO is converted to DOTCL, the, the dichloride analog in gastric acid conditions, 
where the supporting evidence uh, in the form of an in vitro hydrolysis study uh, showed this quite nicely. And the really cross-fulfilling the information requirement was accepted. It resulted in a reproductive toxicity 1B classification based on the dichloride compounds classification and subsequently into identification as a substance of very high concern. And then the registrant conducted further in vivo testing to overrule this really cross. So to summarize, and I need to stress that this slide here is uh, only in its message meant for complex endpoints such as repeat dose toxicity, reproductive toxicity, carcinogenicity, developmental toxicity, and higher tier uh, genotoxicity. When we look whether alternative methods to animal testing can be used for uh, risk management purposes, we need to ask ourselves whether they enable classification labeling, DNL derivation, or target organ identification at the same level. And for the currently established in silico and QSA methods, uh, we, we cannot answer that with the yes. It's, it's a no. And the same holds true for in vitro methods, uh, where even though substances may be tested in organs on a chip, as some call it, or in a 3D structure uh, of, of cell clusters, this still does not allow us uh, to fulfill these risk management goals. Um, being useful for classification, DNA derivation, and target organ identification. However, Redicross, when supported by these methods, is very well able as a useful adaptation to be an alternative to further animal testing, um, and is, in my opinion, the single most powerful method when it's based on higher tier studies, which serve as so-called bridge pillars, and then the supporting information is the bridge plane. Coming to the key messages and wrapping up, really cross is one uncertainty among many, and the question of whether it is just one uncertainty or the one uncertainty is case-specific. It always requires data to support the hypothesis. I would advise a change of really cross assessment framework perspective when predicting from a known hazard instead of absence of effects. And read across is resource optimization so that we can ensure the safe use across the chemical universe in as little as time as possible. My thanks go out to my colleagues, especially Chiara, Jonas, Niklas, and the read across network. Also, Leonard Anger, uh, who is also filling teaching obligations with me for the ERT program in Germany. And I look forward in case you have questions and there's still time. Thank you very much, Jochen. A very clear presentation on Read Across. Um, we don't have any questions and we've gone over time. So my thanks to everybody for sticking with us uh, for the little bit uh, that we went over. Uh, thanks to all the contributors today. Thanks to all of you online for participating uh, in the virtual world. I really hope it was useful for you and for your work. Um, and I think the theme that we hear in all the presentations today was about collaboration and uh, interaction. So just, just reinforce that message that we continue to do that uh, in the way we have been doing. Do bring us your issues, as uh, Louise did this morning. If you have anything you want to raise, feel free to bring that to us bilaterally, and we'll always try to improve our tools and navigate through this uh, complex processes that we all work on. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the next dossiers. So thank you from me, and have a good afternoon wherever you are.